Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Well, welcome back. We're in the middle of week four, and we've talked about the how we treat scattering physically and how we treat scattering in a nanoscale MOSFET. Uh, in lectures five and six, we're going to relate this model to the traditional model, and we're going to look more carefully at some experimental data. But I want to take a little pause here and talk about mobility. Now, mobility is a concept that has a clear physical meaning in large bulk semiconductors. It's not so clear what it means in a small nanoscale transistor. In fact, some people will tell you that you shouldn't even speak of mobility in a small device. Now, there's been a lot of thought. Uh, experimentalists find that the mobility of a semiconductor correlates with the on current of a very small MOSFET. So there is some connection there. And I'm going to talk in this lecture to try to help us understand about what that physical connection is really all about. Okay, so uh, just review the model one more time that we're getting comfortable with. We have this scattering model in Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. The mathematics is a little simpler. And we have current that's proportional to a transmission for small drain to source voltage. And it's a little more complicated because of the necessity of maintaining charge balance when we go to high drain bias. And we get a transmission over two minus transmission. And we learn that these two transmissions are different in the linear region and the saturated region. Now, let's back up for a second and, and recall what we mean by diffusive transport. If I've got a resistor of length L, you know, maybe this is the channel length of a MOSFET under small drain to source bias, and I bias it up and let electrons flow from one contact to the other, generally there will be scattering events that will knock electrons around at a random direction, but on average the net flow would be from the left contact to the right contact if I apply a positive voltage on the right contact that attracts electrons. Now, when the mean free path is much, much shorter than the length of the resistor, we call this diffusive transport. And then we get these familiar relations. Velocity is minus mobility times the electric field. And we get this classic expression for the mobility, Q tau over M, where average tau is the average time between these scattering events that are knocking everything around. So this is a very well-defined material parameter and it's valid when we're doing measurements or thinking about devices where the region is many mean free paths long. That's not actually what we're interested in. We're interested in nanoscale transistors where the channels are very short. So the kinds of devices we're interested in are this. First of all, we're not near equilibrium, low bias, where mobility tends to be measured. We could have a large drain voltage and we could give the carriers lots of kinetic energy and be very far from equilibrium. So the scattering is much different and it's not at all clear that mobility has any relevance. Electrons come in, they emit lattice vibrations, they scatter around, they rattle around for a while and most of them go out the drain. But uh, there is a way to think about how mobility might make some physical significance here and the way we think about it is this. The mobility is proportional to the near equilibrium mean free path. We'll see that in a minute a little more clearly. The classic expression is Q tau over M, but instead of expressing mobility in terms of scattering time, we could re-express mobility in terms of scattering length, the mean free path. So the mobility is proportional to the near equilibrium mean free path. Now the on current in a device like this under high bias is proportional, is determined by backscattering in this critical region near the top of the barrier, the area that we've been calling the virtual source. And that's an area where electrons have not yet gained much kinetic energy. They're close to equilibrium. So the backscattering is controlled uh, in a region in which backscattering is determined also by the near equilibrium mean free path. So from that line of reasoning, we can conclude that the near equilibrium mobility is really what's limiting or determining the on current. Now it's important to note that 
near the drain end where the carriers are very energetic and there's a lot of scattering, the mean free path is very, very small, much smaller than you would deduce from the mobility. But that's not what limits the on current. What limits the on current is what goes on there in the bottleneck region, that little region of length L. So the way we think about this is current is related to transmission, transmission is related to mean free path, mean free path is related to mobility, and in that sense, there's a connection between mobility and mean free path, even though it's hard physically to think about a mobility in these very, very short devices. So if we have a measured mobility, we can extract the mean free path. And that means that we can take the measured mobility, extract the mean free path, deduce the transmission, and then estimate the current that we will get. Okay, so the classic expression is the mobility is related in terms of scattering time, but it's more appropriate for us in this Landauer picture that we're using to relate the mobility to mean free path. So how do we do that? So let me remind you, when we had the lecture on transmission, I spent a little bit of time relating the diffusion coefficient to the mean free path. And we came up with a very simple expression under Maxwell Boltzmann statistics that gave us the diffusion coefficient in centimeters squared per second and related it to the unidirectional thermal velocity, V sub t, and the mean free path lambda naught. I'm assuming a constant mean free path, that's what the subscript zero is for. If that's not the case, if the mean free path depends on energy, then it would be an appropriate average mean free path. So thermal velocity divided by mean free path, uh, thermal velocity times mean free path divided by two. And that gives us the diffusion coefficient. So it's very clear how the diffusion coefficient is related to the mean free path. And the Einstein relation under near equilibrium conditions gives us the mobility from the diffusion coefficient. D over mu is equal to kT over Q. So it's very easy to relate the mobility to the mean free path. So let's look at an example. Let's take a reasonable carrier mobility for a state-of-the-art device, say a 22 nanometer device these days. Mobility roughly you know, on the order of 200 centimeters squared per volt second in a silicon MOSFET. Okay. Now, if I want the diffusion coefficient, I just use the Einstein relation. So the diffusion coefficient is a little more than five centimeters squared per second. Now remember, I'm assuming Maxwell Boltzmann statistics here. We'll talk about Fermi Dirac in a minute. I can compute the unidirectional thermal velocity. But in order to do that, I need to know what effective mass to use. So let's stop and look at that um, just for a, a little bit here. So here's a situation that we have. We have electrons. They're either confined in a small bulk MOSFET by the electric field, and then there is some quantum confinement and some energy states, or they're confined by a very thin silicon layer in an extremely thin SOI device but they're quantum mechanically confined and they're these sets of energy levels. The Fermi level will end up being somewhere. So some of those energy levels are populated and some are empty. Let's assume that only the lowest one is populated. That tends to be a pretty good assumption under on-current conditions for, for modern silicon devices. Okay. Now, what we are interested in is what is the effective mass in the xy plane? Because this direction y is normal to the channel, that's the direction of confinement, electrons are moving in the xy plane. The effective mass in the xy plane is going to be used to determine the unidirectional thermal velocity in the xy plane. Well, we're talking about silicon, and remember that the conduction band of silicon has these six ellipsoids with constant energy surfaces. And the ellipsoids are determined by two different effective masses, a longitudinal effective mass in the long direction and a transverse effective mass that's equal in the two orthogonal directions. So we have the six ellipsoids pointed along the coordinate axes. And if we look at this, we can see that we're squeezing the electron wave function and confining it in the y direction. That means that these electrons are going to respond with an effective mass in the y direction. 
So the two blue ellipsoids have a heavy effective mass, a longitudinal effective mass in the confinement direction. They'll produce energy levels that are determined by that heavy effective mass. The other four valleys in the y direction have the light transverse effective mass. And when you do a particle in a box, the energy levels go as one over the mass of the electron that's confined. So these are going to have confined states, but they're going to be much higher in energy than the blue states. So if only the lowest one is occupied, it's only those two blue valleys that we need to worry about. Y is a direction of confinement, and the motion then of the electrons in the channel is in the XZ plane. So in the XZ plane, we're dealing with the transverse effective mass. The mass is the same in both directions. So the mass that we should use when computing the thermal velocity is the light transverse mass. You should also note that we have two of these valleys. So that means that there is a valley degeneracy of two. Okay, that means we can go back. We can plug in the transverse effective mass here. That's how we get a unidirectional thermal velocity of 1.2 times 10 to the seventh. And if I just plug numbers in, I get a mean free path of nine nanometers. Put that into my expression for transmission, and we get a transmission of 30%. So that gives us some rough feels for what numbers that we can uh, expect in modern day uh, transistors. But it's also important to realize that above threshold, we really should be using Fermi Dirac statistics. We just use Maxwell Boltzmann because it sort of illustrates things and it's easy to do the mathematics. But Maxwell Boltzmann statistics really don't apply because the Fermi level is above the bottom of the band. The measured mobility is still the same but it's in deducing the mean free path that we have to be a little more careful about. So let's go back. Let's back up a little bit. We need to figure out how to relate the, how to relate the mobility to mean free path under more general conditions. It's easy under Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. Let's back up to our Landauer expression for the current. We're only dealing with near equilibrium conditions where we're measuring mobilities. Under near equilibrium conditions, current is conductance times voltage. We get this expression that we've seen before for the conductance. Okay. We're dealing in the diffusive limit because we're measuring the mobility in a long channel device or a bulk semiconductor. So in the diffusive limit, the transmission is mean free path divided by length. And that means that we can get a simple expression for the transmission in terms of the mean free path. Now we know from you know, textbook semiconductor physics, we're all familiar with writing the, the conductance as conductivity times width divided by length. And conductivity is sheet carrier density times charge times mobility. So these are just two ways of writing the same thing. This is a rigorous way that comes from the uh, Landauer approach. This is just a definition. Now if I equate these two, I'll get a definition for the mobility. And that definition will be in terms of the mean free path. And that's exactly what we're after. So we end up with this expression that looks a little bit forbidding, but we can do the calculation. This tells us how we relate the mobility to the mean free path. M is the number of channels at energy E per unit width. To make things simple, we can assume that the mean free path is independent of energy. And then I can write this expression as 1 over the sheet carrier density, 2q over Planck's constant mean free path, times the number of channels in the Fermi window. And we determine that by doing this integral. And we do that integral, the appropriate effective mass is the transverse effective mass, and we get an expression for it. We know how to relate the sheet carrier density to the Fermi level, we've seen that several times. So we know everything and we can evaluate this expression, and we get a, an expression for the mobility in terms of the mean free path. It's a little more complicated than the Maxwell-Boltzmann result. It is the Maxwell-Boltzmann result in these square brackets, but it's multiplied by a ratio of Fermi-Dirac integrals that will numerically change the final answer. So this is how we really should relate mean free path to mobility.
So if we go back to our example, we have the same mobility. Now we can deduce a mean free path using Fermi Dirac statistics. We'll just use the appropriate formula. So if we do that, the first thing that we're faced with is how do we evaluate these two Fermi Dirac integrals? To do that, we need to know the location of the Fermi level. How do we find that? Well, the location of the Fermi level determines the sheet carrier density. Okay? The sheet carrier density is something that we can deduce. It's basically C inversion times Vg minus Vt divided by the charge on an electron. And in a good MOSFET, that number approaches 10 to the 13th per square centimeter. So let's just assume 10 to the 13th, keep things simple. We can use that number then to deduce what the Fermi Dirac integral of order zero is, it's 2.45. We might remember that the Fermi Dirac integral of order zero has an analytical expression in terms of the normalized Fermi energy. So we can solve for the location of the Fermi energy, put it in our expression here, and evaluate the Fermi Dirac integral of order minus one half, work out the numbers, and it comes out to 1.52. So we find that the mean free path is the value that we obtain under Maxwell-Boltzmann conditions multiplied by 1.52, so it's about 14 nanometers. So it's big enough that when we're analyzing real data, we want to worry about these effects. Plug that into our expression for transmission, and we get transmission of about 40% instead of 30%. So it does make a little bit of a difference. Okay, now let's, let's go on to a related example. Same device, let's assume that we're under on-current conditions now and that we get about 50% of the on-current. And now let's ask the question, how long is that bottleneck region that the electrons have to get over? Well, we'll make the assumption that in this region, the mean free path is roughly the near equilibrium mean free path that we deduce from the mobility. We know that the on-current is the ballistic value multiplied by this ratio of transmission over two minus transmission. If we observe experimentally that this ratio is 50%, then we can deduce the transmission and we find that it's two thirds. If I know that the transmission is two thirds, then I can use my expression that transmission is mean free path over mean free path plus the length of the critical bottleneck region and I can deduce that the bottleneck region is about one-third of the channel in this particular example. So these numbers are rough and approximate, um, but it gives us a feel for what kind of numbers we're dealing with and orders of magnitude and things like that. Okay, so we've talked about mobility. It really is relevant to these very short channel devices, and that was actually quite a surprise when we were first of all sorting this all out and trying to understand why experimentally there seemed to be a correlation, but our understanding of transport physics told us that this was really a parameter that we shouldn't be using at that length scale. But it is important, we find. And we find that we can estimate the near equilibrium mean free path from the measured mobility, then we can use that mean free path to estimate the transmission. And since current is related tr to transmission in the Landauer picture that we're using, then we can relate that transmission to the current. Okay, so uh, we have two more lectures coming up this week. We're going to relate this approach to the traditional approach in the next lecture, and then we'll look more carefully at experimental data in the final lecture this week. Thank you.